Good morning, whatever time of day it is where you are joining us from. Welcome to another episode of Win TV. I'm Jamila Bay. I'm in the host chair today, as you can see. I'm filling in for our publisher, Denise Rolark Barnes, who is away. She will be back with us next Friday. And uh, for those who don't know who I am, I'm the digital content manager here at the Washington Informer. I also host a radio show on WPFW each Thursday at two. It's called the Sex, Politics, and Religion Hour. Spar with Jamila. That's where we love to talk about all the things that my mom and probably yours too uh, told you you should never race in polite conversation, but they're the most interesting things to discuss, unless something here on One TV, of course. Uh, we certainly hope that you've had the opportunity to grab this week's edition of the Washington Informer. Uh, it is, if I may say so myself, rather informative, rather interesting. And you should definitely check it out. If you can go online and read the digital edition, you should go to WashingtonInformer.com. If you are joining us today from Facebook, welcome. Please be sure to share this broadcast. If you're on Twitter, hashtag us. Let us know that you're following us. We will certainly follow back. And uh, we would love to also have you as a subscriber, not just to the paper, but to our YouTube channel. 
Uh, we're at Washington Informer TV, so we're easy to find. This week's show, we are going to have a a couple of really interesting interviews that have been pre-recorded. We're going to show the video conversation between our editor, Kevin McNair, and Mark Morial, who is, of course, president of the National Urban League. The Urban League's conference is being held in the nation's capital as we speak. And uh, Kayla Benjamin, who is our climate and sustainability reporter through Report for America, will be joining us. Uh, she'll be talking with Heather McTeer Tony who is Vice President of Community Engagement for the Environmental Defense Fund. We're also going to air another recorded segment when our publisher, Denise Rolark barnes spoke with Kemba Smith. Now, you may remember Kemba Smith was a domestic violence victim. She had her sentence commuted by President Bill Clinton, and uh, that that was indeed a, a huge news story, and we're delighted to have Kemba on WEN TV this week. Brenda Seiler will be hosting our business segment with the owners of All Set Restaurant and Bar, and then we're going to hear Brenda's recorded conversation with songstress supreme Frida Payne. So let's get started. We're going to watch this week's news recap broadcast by Curtis Knowles, and then we're going to go right into Kevin's interview with Mark Morial. Stay with us. This is Win TV News, bringing you the news that matters. The FDA has officially approved an emergency use authorization of the latest coronavirus vaccine. Available to either Covavax or Nuvaxavid, the vaccine is a two-dose treatment with shots given 21 days apart for adults and those who are 18 and older. Peter Marks, the director of the Center for Biology Evaluation and Research at the FDA, said, quote, having a protein-based alternative may be more comfortable for some in terms of their acceptance of vaccines. Novavax, which is a Maryland-based biotechnological company, has already officiated an agreement with the United States Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Defense in securing 3.2 million initial doses of the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine. D.C. Councilmember Mary Che has floated legislation prohibiting forms of segregated confinement in jails and youth detention facilities. The Ward 3 Democrat on Monday introduced the Eliminating Restrictive and Segregated Enclosure Solitary Confinement Act of 2022, which would strictly limit the use of safe cells. The bill also will require the Department of Corrections and the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services to devise a plan to eliminate solitary confinement and to report to the council on the impacts of doing so. Che has attempted to pass this bill in some form during past council periods. She commented saying, quote, studies have shown that solitary confinement has many negative effects, including increased risk of addiction, recidivism, and suicide. WNBA star Brittany Griner has pleaded guilty to drug smuggling. She told a Russian court on Thursday that she didn't intend to commit a crime, but in a rush to pack her luggage, she accidentally carried a small amount of cannabis oil. There have been growing calls for her release, and many observers have opined that Russia is using the 31-year-old as a political pawn. It's believed Russian President Vladimir Putin would free Griner if the United States did likewise for convicted arms dealer Victor Botts. It's unknown whether Griner's guilty plea is part of an overall strategy to bring her home, with the thought of not dragging out the court case and lessening the spotlight. Dangerous heat will continue to grip much of the country Thursday as cities report record-breaking temperatures from coast to coast. A total of 100 million people in the U.S. were under heat alerts Wednesday, touching parts of 28 states from California to New England. The U.S. population will experience highs as above 90 degrees, and the number of 100-degree days to date is ranked in the top five for many areas. Washington, D.C., where 100 degrees is forecasted for Sunday, the last time the nation's capital hit the mark was in 2016. And both D.C. and New York could experience heat indexes as high as 102, particularly on Thursday. Welcome to Win TV. This is D. Kevin McNear, the senior editor for The Washington Informer. And today we're joined with Mark Morial, president and CEO of the National Urban League, a position you've had for almost 20 years now. So happy anniversary Thank coming you. up next May. Um, we're going to get right to it because there's so much we want to talk about and we have limited time. I think the first thing I want to ask you about, however, is the United States inflation rate, which has reached a new 40-year high and 9.1%. And we know that that's particularly impacting Black and Hispanic families uh, across the United States, gas prices, food prices. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, kudos uh, to Denise and the Washington Informer team uh, for what you all continue to do, which is to be truthful, informative, uh, and all about civil rights, justice, and equity. 
on behalf of black America and black Washingtonians. Having said that, I like to talk about inflation. We have a year in which, a year and a half in which we've seen jobs come back at a feverish pace after the Great Recession pushed millions and millions of people into the unemployment lines. So jobs have come back and black joblessness is now below six. Overall joblessness is below four. The disparity still exists, but it's a far cry from the 15 to 20 percent inflation uh, unemployment we were seeing. Having said that, these inflation, the inflation we see today is being driven by the aftermath of COVID and the war in Ukraine. What is the aftermath of COVID? China, which provides the United States with so much of its manufactured goods. China, which is responsible for one third of all manufacturing in the world, has not completely reopened. Uh, they still are on a lockdown phase. Therefore, the supply of goods, the supply of appliances and manufactured goods and clothing is slow and supply is tight, which has upward pressure on prices. Secondly, the war in Ukraine has disrupted uh, the production of oil and petroleum products uh, in a significant way because Russia, uh, which uh, has invaded Ukraine, is one of the big producers. And uh, there are those that are now refusing to buy Russian gas, Russian oil, uh, and it is creating upward pressures on that. Thirdly, Ukraine is one of the largest producers of grain in the world. Uh, and absolutely being at war with uh, people being pushed out of the country with bombing taking place. Many of those farms are not operational sure. and mm -hmm. it affects the supply of grain. Now, we may not use uh, uh, Ukrainian grain here in the United States in a large way, but it creates pressure on those that now want to buy our grain that we produce, whether it's corn, wheat, soy, uh, you name it. So there's some factors beyond let's say the White House and the Federal Reserve uh, that uh, are driving this inflation. It's not the time to panic. It is okay. the time to be vigilant, the time to be di diligent. And we know whenever we have difficult economic times, whether it's higher unemployment or higher inflation, black America pays the greatest cost and indeed the greatest price. Let's walk back six years to the 2016 election. Three of these justices were nominated by President Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Because we had low black voter turnout in 2016, that's why mm -hmm. Roe was overturned. For the first time in modern American history, the Supreme Court has taken away individual rights, snatched back uh, women's right to make the decision. And it's always been simple for me. It isn't about pro or anti-abortion. It's about who makes the choice. The Supreme Court undercut the individual right, right. the right, yes. the constitutional right of a woman to control. Nothing's more sacred than what takes place in your own body. Mm -hmm. And that's why it is a deeply troubling and disturbing decision. You have justices saying, well, there's no explicit right to an abortion. Uh, there's no explicit right to an automobile in the Constitution. There's no the Constitution says nothing about televisions. It says nothing about the internet, but we recognize free speech as attaching to new sure. technologies that didn't exist uh, when in fact the uh, Constitution was written. So people shouldn't be confused. The Constitution is a document of values and principles, not a list of do's and don'ts. Right. And the role sure. of the Supreme Court is to apply those constitutional values and principles to today's America. This Supreme Court is functioning like an unelected legislative junta, hmm. where they're going to sit back and second guess everything that's taken place in the last 70 years and say, well, we think Roe was uh, decided wrongly. Uh, well, this is all about the politics of the far right, 
was through Donald Trump staged a coup, a judicial coup, and took over the Supreme Court. About 20 interns, uh, college interns from a wide range of universities and colleges who were with us this summer. Uh, they just did a presentation for us on voting. And one of the things they said is we have to send a message that we're not going to let this voter suppression stop us from voting. That if we have to take a day off from work, you know, if we have to march 100 miles to get to the polling place, we are going to vote. We are going to work. I think what this is really all about, and it kind of ties into the Biden administration, is a great deal of frustration that yeah. we couldn't get the John Lewis bill through the Senate. Mm -hmm. Why couldn't we get it through the Senate? Two people are responsible for the inability to get that through the Senate. Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema, who would not, at this moment of great, great challenge for America, would not carve out an exception to the filibuster rule. Because without the right to vote, look, economic policy, education policy, trade policy, uh, infrastructure, technology, they are important if we do not have a seat at the table, which is what voting gives us. Certainly. We're on the menu. Mm -hmm. We're gonna be marginalized. We're gonna be talking to ourselves, intellectualizing about policy, raising hell, and no one will pay attention. Part of our power, it's not all of our power, mm -hmm. is participating at the ballot box to make our voice heard and not falling into the trap of cynicism and defeatism and feeling sorry for ourselves and saying, well, I don't like the candidate, so I'm going to just stay home. You've just basically said, you all pick the leaders. I'm mm -hmm. going to sit in my Chase Lounge chair and go on Instagram and send sure. out some messages. Right. The George Floyd policing bill, uh, difficult, once again, filibuster stops it, passes the House more than once. So this is what's important. We have to continue to work. We have to continue to be smart. We got to continue to fight for those things, those measures that we know in the best interest of the country. Final thing I'll say, George Floyd Justice Policing Bill, Voting Rights Act, uh, child tax credit, have support from 60 to 65 percent, in some cases higher amongst the American people. Yet the Senate erects a blockade to prevent them from becoming law. We uh, are I'm so grateful for having letting you for you coming on to Men TV. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that interview, Kevin. Uh, up next, we've got our uh, Kayla Benjamin uh, interviewing Heather McTeer Tony of the Environmental Defense Fund. So I'm going to toss it to you, Kayla. Take it away. Thanks so much, Jamila. And uh, Heather, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, welcome to Win TV. We're really excited to have you. Um, so you are the Vice President of Community Engagement for the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, and I'd love it if you just tell us a little bit about how you got interested in the environmental space and got to be where you are at the EDF. Well, thanks so much, Kayla, for, for having me. And absolutely thanks to the Washington Informer for just talking about such an important critical issue around climate and environment. Uh, I was not an environmentalist to start off with. In fact, I would say I was far from it. I was one of the people who, you know, I thought environmental work was for white people who were vegan and wore Birkenstocks and hug trees. And it, you know, that, it, that was really a point for me because I never saw myself in the environmental movement. Uh, I never saw people who were really talking about environment and climate in the way that we talk about it now. So when I was a young mayor of Greenville, Mississippi, um, I was working on water issues in my community and the newly appointed administrator for the EPA, Lisa Jackson, made a visit to my community. And in a side conversation, she said, you know, you're doing environmental justice work, right? 
And I said, no, surely I'm not. And she said, no, actually, you really are. And it opened my eyes to not only how integrated environment and climate issues are into everyday social issues, particularly in the African-American community, but how much we had lost, how much we were left out, and how many resources were really passing by minority communities. So it, it urged me to action. And I'm so excited that now in my role uh, at the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, as the lead for community engagement across the organization, we're really able to talk about how we see ourselves and how we show up in the climate movement, no matter who we are or where we are. You were talking about who is showing up in this environmental movement. And about three years ago, you wrote an op-ed in New York Times about spotlighting Black women that are leading the charge on preventing climate change. So in the time since then, have you seen anything shift or things change about whose voices are being elevated in, in this space? Well, certainly since that time of, of the, the New York Times piece, really to, to see what was in front of us, we have always been visibly invisible. And that's what uh, I learned from uh, Lisa Jackson is that we're here, we're doing this work and we're all around. Uh, we needed to be able to highlight that. And I'm seeing it more and more and more. So for example, it used to be when you would Google environmentalists or what does an environmentalist look like? You came up with those images that I referred to before. That's how I, I learned. But now we see amazing women not only stepping into the spotlight, but really taking up space and bringing together the lived experience of the African-American community to climate solutions. So it's like seeing um, Dr. Jelan White Newsom, who's now in the White House, talking about environmental justice from a senior level, uh, all the way to Dr. Beverly Wright, who's been doing this work for longer than I have been alive and leading the HBCU Climate Change Consortium. Uh, we could go on and on and on with names of people who I not only shared in that piece, but have really now um, stepped into some phenomenal spaces that we need to take note of. And I think the rest of the world is taking note of because the climate crisis is not waiting for any of us. It is not uh, a far off foregone conclusion. Uh, we are feeling the impacts of extreme weather, extreme heat, and the way that it undergirds and makes even worse social issues in uh, minority communities, particularly uh, Black communities, low-income communities, and communities that are on the front lines of the climate crisis. So right now we need not only this elevation, and I'm glad to see more Black women who are in this space, but we need even more. We absolutely need even more. There's so much work to do. And something that you talked about in the piece that I thought was really interesting, especially when it comes to Black communities in the environmental movement was your faith and how your faith and um, Christianity intersects with your work in the environment. So I'd love for you to just talk a little bit about that. So Kayla, uh, I am from the South. I was born and raised in Greenville, Mississippi, and come from a rich background of men and women that are in the faith, in the Christian faith, but have really shaped what and who I am even to this day. And it it was always amazing to me that going to church on Sunday morning or Wednesday night or Friday night for prayer or Saturday for choir rehearsal, wherever we were, we were always talking and praising and and, and really embodying the natural elements around us. Uh, scriptures and being repeated in song and uh, in Easter speeches about um the, the, the streams and meadows and the beauty of the natural environment and how it yearns out for man to not only care for it, but also how we coexist together. And I just couldn't figure out, you know, why are we not talking about creation care as a part of our requirement as those who are a part of the Christian faith? You know, it's really important that in every aspect of addressing the climate crisis right now today, we use all the tools and resources that we have at our disposal. And that includes our faith. It includes using 
the mechanisms that we uh, bring that bring us joy to a part of this conversation because therein we find solutions. And I think you know, as we move forward in not only talking and addressing some of the really tough problems that we have ahead of us, for example, eradicating transportation pollution that we know is more prevalent in communities of color than it is in just urban areas, or finding ways even now to uh, utilize the executive authority of our president in order to make sure that we're addressing the climate crisis if, if climate Congress does not, uh, using Justice 40 as a way that we are talking about and implementing climate and resiliency measures in communities across this country. All of these things, we need every part of our being, including science, including our faith, including uh, the neighborhoods that we are just walking around and playing in every single day. We need every single one of these elements to come together. That's what community is. It's not the isolation of an issue or the isolation of climate change as an issue that is for somebody else. Community is the way in which we wrap these issues together. And in the Black community, really understanding that the reason sometimes our social justice problems are exasperated have to do with climate. Kayla, if you give me just one second, I'll give you an example. We have in the United States of America today, not only extreme heat that is hitting all parts of our country, but that is hitting black and brown communities, particularly urban heat islands. Those are the places where we have a lot of concrete, a lot of asphalt, not too many green spaces. Those places are on average hotter than other communities. So quite literally, our homes, our churches, our playgrounds are set to a low bake temperature as we go outside. It means that when we are sending our kids outside to play, and most of us in the South, we don't because we know better at this point in time, it's just too hot outside, that the issues of asthma or health, health issues, they're exasperated for people of color. But there are other elements that concern us that go along with this. Violence, gun violence. Um, these are clear places where not only there's concern, but we know it gets worse as it gets hotter. So when we put these things together, we can clearly draw a line to show how climate issues are not only important in our communities, but they are critical to solving other social justice problems that we all worry about late at night. So I know a lot of those problems that you touched on, you probably also talk about in your new book, um, so I'd love for you to talk about what your book's about and when it's coming out and where we should look for it. Absolutely. Well, I did. I wrote a book called Before the Street Lights Come On, Black America's Urgent Call for Climate Solutions, to really carry us through that, that story of showing all the social justice issues that we are often concerned about and, and really why we should be talking about climate more often and why it's not the stereotype that Black people don't talk about climate. Uh, you can find the book uh, available to purchase online now. It's not going to be in bookstores until Earth Day 2023. So we've got a little bit of time, but please go ahead and pre-order your copy. And we're really excited just to be able to continue the conversation around community engagement and all the things and solutions we can do uh, in, in so many different ways. Black communities have a story to tell. They have solutions to give, lived experience that we can all learn from. And I dig into that in my book a bit. It, again, it's available online, so you can go to Amazon, Walmart, Barnes & Nobles, your local bookstore, and go ahead and pre-order the copy. And in the meantime, we're going to continue to do the work uh, at the Environmental Defense Fund and with a lot of our partners to continue raising awareness of how we should all be not only a part of climate solutions, but really work to broaden the circle of people involved in those solutions. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and have a great day. I'll pass it back to Jamila. Thanks so much, Kayla. Thank you. Thank you so much for that fantastic conversation, Kayla. Um, I don't have much to say, but stay tuned. We're going to go over to our segment now with Denise Rolark-Barnes and Kemba Smith. 
Emma Smith Pradia, welcome to Win TV. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much, Denise Barnes, for having me on. I really appreciate the continued support. It's our pleasure. I think you can tell it in a in a nutshell uh, about you know your days at Hampton and and uh, actually how you got caught up in the criminal justice system. You want to go over that for us really quickly? Yes, as a first time uh, nonviolent drug offender. I was sentenced to 24 and a half years in federal prison, um, basically backtracking. Um, I was a, a college student at Hampton, um, got involved in, I try not to say, um, you know, a bad, poor, wrong um, relationship, but it, it was a, a relationship that wasn't healthy. Um, and uh, he was a drug dealer and abusive and, um, I started to um, not value myself the way that I should have when I started Hampton. Um, and I started, um, you know, wanting to uh, please and wanting to be there for this person. I would see him come on campus and pick up other girls and wondered, you know, who this person was. And so eventually when he started noticing me and giving me attention, um, it made me feel good about me. And I think I thought like some of the other girls on campus, you know, whatever he does is his business. I'm doing school. Um, and eventually we developed this three and a half year relationship. And um, then there were these red flags. And eventually, um, you know, there was abuse where, you um, the first time when he hit me, I thought that he was going to actually kill me. Um, and so I really didn't, as a, a young, naive college student, I really didn't know how to navigate those waters. So, you know, you mentioned me speaking at Baloo High School. Um, it's been really important for me to share my story for two reasons. Number one, you know, I don't feel it's feel as if each and every young person has to make each and every mistake there is to make in life that they can hear another person's story. And, um, you know, not want to go down that same path. And then the second reason is because I've been, um, I, I had someone tell me, um, you know, Kemba, you're an OG when it comes to this criminal justice reform movement, because you were doing it before any of us were. Um, but back in, you know, 2001, because um, I was released in December 2000, um, what was on my mind was, you know, the people that I left behind and how they deserved a second chance, too. So um, I was fortunate that, you know, even though I had a 24 and a half year sentence, um, the president commuted my sentence after serving six and a half years. And that was something that was a modern day miracle, especially in an age where there was no social media. Um, so ever since my release, I've been on this path. He eventually was um, murdered in Seattle, Washington. Um, I often share that, um, you know, I'm grateful that, you know, I had my son, that I was pregnant with him because I believe that's what motivated Peter to realize that I needed to go back home um, to my parents. So um, had I not been, had I not gone home, it's a very strong possibility that I could have been in the same apartment that he was murdered in. There was a, a movement and, you know, I'm grateful to um, Emerge Magazine and George Curry and Reginald Stewart, who wrote the article. A lot of people have never even heard of Emerge Magazine, but um, because of the article that was printed um, and the national attention that the article received, it caused the NAACP Legal Defense Fund to take on my case pro bono. And Elaine Jones, she was director of the Legal Defense Fund at the time and was from Norfolk, Virginia. And she made a commitment that she wanted to make sure my case saw justice. And so it wasn't about you know, them feeling sorry for me or feeling sorry for my parents because I was my parents' only child. It was because the fastest growing population at the time were Black women in prison. And Elaine hoped that my case would set a precedent for other cases. But once you see that history and that investment in, you know, organization helping, you know, to free me, it was just... To much is given, much is required. One of the things that 
I'm disappointed um, and even years ago um, that when there was expert testimony at my sentencing hearing where there were experts talking about the domestic violence that I had endured and talking about my relationship with Peter, um, that the government didn't take it into consideration um, in my sentencing. And so I think it's really important for you know, us to work as a community on the front end um, to make sure that we're dealing with, you know, mental health issues that our young people may be experiencing. I just think that it's imperative that we deal with these issues in the front end, um, make it more, um, make, make, allow space in our schools and in our communities and in our churches for young people to be vulnerable about certain things that they may be going through and making sure that there's, you know, instead of having, you know, um, school, uh, school resource officers, maybe you need to make sure that there's sufficient enough, um, you know, counselors in the school, mental health counselors or social workers that can be of benefit um, to our young people. And, um, you know, with um, people, even inside facilities. I don't, I, I don't believe that people that have mental health problems should be housed in our prisons and jails. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, you know, there's a time where mental health facilities had been shutting down and that's where, you know, people that have mental health issues have been going. So I think it's something that fundamentally we need to reevaluate our current systems and figure out alternatives um, to incarceration because we live in a country that incarcerate its own people more than any other nation in the world. Um, and I think that's something that we need to look at. And, you know, unfortunately, I think, you know, what you were alluding to, too, with our young people and that translate to the adults. I mean, we're seeing the vast amount of crime um, that's being reported. Um, but I do think what we're not looking at is is what what what's going on in the front end that we could be doing differently um, to ensure that people don't wind up um, going into certain lifestyles and making sure that they're the prop proper resources are out there for people in order for them to be self sufficient. I ended up giving birth to my son while I was incarcerated, and five minutes after I gave birth to him. Um, my leg um, had to be handcuffed and shackled to the bed. Um, the judge, when I turned myself in six months pregnant, he denied giving me a bond. Um, and so motherhood, um, giving birth to my son was, you know, very traumatic um, for me. And, you know, one of the things that I think is so inhumane um, is the fact that after I gave birth to my son, I wasn't able to hold, touch, feel, smell him um, until I was transferred to federal prison, which were months later after I had given birth to him. I don't really understand how we live in this nation. Um, and, and, you know, people have analyzed and, you know, there's certain states now that have um, alternatives to incarceration for um, parents um, that, you know, will allow them to be able to stay out with their kids. But in in motherhood and, and raising my son, one of the things that I realized was that we needed to go to counseling. Um, and so we did do that. But I, you know, I have to be transparent and I try not to talk too much about him now that he's a grown man. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, there are things that still arise from that period of separation, um, even as an adult. And, you know, I don't think people truly realize the impact of incarceration on families um, and families end up being victims, too. Somebody may have had that uncle that you knew not to, you know, let your kids sit on their lap, but it's like the secret. We need to make sure that in our communities that we start talking openly about mental health issues or issues that our families have experienced so that we can prepare the next generation in moving forward. Kimba? 
best wishes. Thank you again for joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again real soon at the release of the movie. Uh, yeah, that's a movie we definitely need to all see. It has to come out first, though. Um, I want to take the opportunity to welcome uh, welcome our own Brenda Seiler to the program. Uh, she is uh, going to do the next interview, but while I had a moment, Brenda, it is a delight to see you. It is always a pleasure to read you, and you keep me in the know, so thank you. It's great to be back here on Win TV. I'm able to cover a lot of different topics that I hope are keeping our audiences uh, interested. So I've got some great stuff to share with you this afternoon. Absolutely. Well, don't have me in your way, please. Thank you. Thank you again, Jamila. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. I uh, want to touch on uh, an issue that I've been covering a lot, and that's how businesses have been surviving through the pandemic. And we're bringing back um, with us a couple that has been with us before, Jennifer Meltzer and Rivas. They are the owners of All Set Restaurant and Bar in downtown Silver Spring at 8630 Fenton Street. And also they own Money Muscle Barbecue. And thank you both, first of all, for being back here. You all have been busy. And we've been talking about businesses that have been able to make it through the pandemic successfully, just like Money Money uh, Muscle Barbecue and um, All Set have. But let's talk about some new things. Talk about um, where you are, are now and this new partnership that you have with Dennis's Brewing. Yeah, um, so we're, we're almost three months now into partnering with Dennis's, and it's been a, a great process to be able to unique process, should I say, to partner with a, a, um, another establishment and focus on our specialty, which is the food, and they focus on their beer. Um, it was kind of an ingenious way to approach expansion to me without having to take on all the other things that come with building a new business. So it's been exciting. And Dennison, let's talk about how that even happened, because you, know, you don't hear about those types of partnerships with other uh, eating establishments. Denison's has two locations. They have a location close to downtown Silver Spring, and then there's another location over in Riverdale. Is that is that correct? And you all, as I understand it, are going to uh, do some masterful things with their menu and what, what diners can expect out of uh, Denison's. Talk a little bit about the menu and how you're going to be adding to their menu. Well, the partnership came around because during the pandemic, I think people really wanted to focus on what they love. They love making beer and we love making food. So we've sort of just been slowly uh, starting to add some of our menu items. So in Riverdale Park, they have a little bit of all set and a little bit of Money Muscle Barbecue and their downtown Silver Spring location uh, definitely has more of the barbecue items. but. Ed has been working on a lot of new ideas because we want to add uh, more menu offerings as well as um, bring in some brunch, 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 happy hour. Well, that's great. And let's talk a little bit about what you're doing at All Set there in downtown Silver Spring. I'm glad you talked about the brunch because you all have been doing some really wonderful innovative things with brunch. There's a jazz brunch. I've attended that. There's a drag brunch. Talk about what people can expect in terms of uh, going beyond all the great food on the menu. Yeah, a lot of Saturdays. So definitely the third Saturday of the month is our drag brunch. And the last Saturday of the month, we're, we're having our, our jazz brunch. So in addition to our whole brunch menu available, you get the shows. And we're just looking, uh, we're open for other kind of ideas. Um, but it's fun just to sort of activate the space in different ways and bring that different energy and um, be inclusive to a lot of the, the partners and our neighbors that we have. Um, Silver Spring is such a diverse area. So we, you know, with the drag and the jazz. Um, Two different demographics. You know, yeah. different people, <laughs> but everyone is welcome. Well, that's great that you're saying that because one of the things that I have always thought about all set, um, and I'm expecting it also to be with denizens at both the locations, 
it's a nice neighborhood restaurant. It's a restaurant that you can go into. Uh, the staff is wonderful, professional, really upbeat all the time, always welcoming. It's an environment where you have not only have indoor seating, you've got outdoor seating, it's, but the weather is nice. And talk a little bit about the menu at All Set in terms of some things that you've, you're you always looking for ways to uh, introduce some new things. So talk about what people can expect for the dining experience there at All Set. We know it's exciting. We just brought in some new culinary talent because as we're expanding, <laughs> you know, things are starting to feel a little stretched out and brought in a couple of new culinary minds that are excited to bring in some new ideas. But you see a little bit more of some Latin influence um, maybe on the happy, yeah, on the happy hour menus. Um, we're also thinking about right now we're not open on Mondays. We're thinking about making that a full fledged barbecue day where you know I'll, I'll be out slicing meats and doing things very very live with and interacting with the guests so yeah, we're always looking for new ways to grow and expand and do new things well that brings in the muscle money barbecue help me understand that concept as well because getting back to one of the things we initially talked about how you survived during the pandemic and um money muscle barbecue was used it's, it's a smoker truck it was used as a way to continue to bring in customers in a way. Talk about um, where that is set up and how that actually worked during the pandemic. It came to me, I think, they saying, Jen, we gotta figure something out. We are, can't do dining. We didn't have guests. And that was, you know, our bread and butter this whole time was always having guests in our building. We did very, very little to go and deliver it. When you think about, to go and deliver, you don't think about sort of soggy fish and we weren't doing oysters to go. And that was sort of our, who we were. And Ed's background and, and interest in barbecue, we thought that is the kind of food that people want to eat right now. That's the kind of food that travels well. And mm -hmm. when we, he's like, we got to get a food truck. We got to get this barbecue out on a food truck. And it was actually wonderful because we used to do, people couldn't come to us anymore. So we started going out into the neighborhoods and it was really nice because then, you know, between your masks and your social distancing, we were recognizing a lot of the people that had come to the restaurant. And it was so nice to see those friendly faces out in their neighborhood. And it just changed everything the way we think about to go and delivery and what it means to be a local family restaurant. It really did just change everything in the barbecue. It's, it's tasty, um, but it definitely kept the seafood, the seafood restaurant in business. That must have been very affirming to know that when you were able to pivot like that with the pandemic, your customers figured out what was going on. They found you and they were still supportive. And I'm sure they're, they're now coming back inside the restaurant now that you are fully open again. How great is that? So thankful. It's amazing. I mean, this community is second to none. I mean, they were so supportive. and. We were, they would invite us back on a weekly basis to bring the same food and it was order different items. So yeah, the community is, we're so thankful and we wouldn't be here without their support. You're right. Barbecue is comfort food. Mm -hmm. And during the, the pandemic, we needed comfort <laughs> on a lot of different levels. And to know that you could get some good comfort food um, and it's some lip smacking good barbecue. I'm sure your customers were really, really excited about that. Do you want to talk a little bit about, or we want to hear a little bit about some of the new things also that you might be looking at doing? I, I, my experience with um, All Set has been one, you've got a facility there that can take private dining for like small groups. Um, I remember one time we came there and there was a bridal shower that was going on in your private room. People may not know that you have that kind of offering as well and with denizens and trying to tie all set to denizen, how are you going about trying to market that? So people know, oh yeah, we got this location here on Fenton Street, but look, there's some other stuff going on that we have our fingerprint on as well. Talk about how you're trying to get the word out about that. In addition to being here with us this afternoon. Well, we have a great PR team, we work with Saber, and we started working with them. Yes. And they've been excellent. <laughs> uh, they, uh, they understand us and they get how to get the word out. So that's been a, a number, a highlight for us to work with a PR team such as Saber. And 
Denison's also does their own PR as well. So working together with them as we look to introduce brunch, now that I've fully moved my, relocated my smokers to Denison's in Silver Spring, people are already looking and seeing that smoke on that part of uh, Georgia Avenue and East West Highway. So I'm excited just, I mean, barbecue kind of sells itself just from being in the air, <laughs> just from people smelling it. So the combination of all of those things has pushed things to the next level. And we want to make sure people understand that Denizen's Brewing is an eating establishment that has beers from all over the world. You know, if that's where you want to go and get some beer on tap or get whatever kind of bottled or canned uh, beers that they have, they have a global selection of beers there. So that makes it a delight as well uh, for people that want to go there. Absolutely. Yes. Definitely. And as we head into the fall, they have a beautiful facility in Riverdale Park that we're excited to start offering beer dinners. And you can actually have a beer dinner in their brewery space. So if you call all set restaurant and bar and our private dining room is booked that day or you're looking for a fun activity, I think, you know, I think bachelor parties, bachelorette parties, that space, I think for a sort of chef driven brewer driven custom experience so you get to try some of their different selections and see how we're pairing with those items it's a really fun activity um so that 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 we're going to be working on having those kind of events as we head in into the fall but right now all three locations are, are more than welcome to to host any kind of uh celebration that one may have yeah well congratulations on what you've been able to do it's not it's not been easy for a lot of businesses, uh, especially now for the restaurant industry, that you've been able to maneuver through the pandemic. We're still in it. It's not over. Um, but you've been able to figure out a way to make it work. And All Set has been successful in um, managing to pivot off of something that was so devastating for all of us with the with the with COVID and the pandemic. And so congratulations. Thanks for being with us this afternoon. And um, all you. the best to you. Have a great day. Thank you soon. Thank you. And now um, I want to share with you the opportunity that I had a week ago to speak with the legendary Frida Payne. She is in town tonight and tomorrow, the 22nd and the 23rd at Blues Alley in um, Georgetown. She's been kicking it. She has never stopped uh, performing. She's got an autobiography out. And so I want you to hear about my chat and uh, with my uh, special guest, Frida Payne, coming up now. Hello, and welcome to this segment of WIN TV. I'm Brenda Seiler. I'm a writer with the Washington Informer covering arts and entertainment. And it is a wonderful opportunity that we have today and that we are going to be talking to legend Frida Payne. She's performing in DC tonight and tomorrow night, July 22nd and 23rd at Blues Alley in Georgetown. So let's bring on Frida and welcome her to Win TV. Hey. Hello, Frida. Hi, Brenda. How are you doing? I am super fantastic and over the moon that we are having this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you so much. Oh, we you're welcome. I, I, can take, I can take my glasses off now because I can see you. <laughs> okay. And we've got a lot to talk about this afternoon because you are a busy woman. You're coming into Blues Alley. You're going to be performing there tonight and tomorrow, July 22nd and 23rd. We're excited about that. Tell right. us a little bit about your show because you've been you've been singing and performing all the time. It's not like you've been sitting idle. So tell us what's going to happen at Blues Alley. Well, um, first of all, it's I open on the 20, what's that, 22nd? 22nd. The 22nd, yes. and I perform another night, the 23rd. I'm doing two shows, and I'm doing a, con a conglomeration of assorted material. A lot of people know me for doing the Ella Fitzgerald stuff, and I'm go I'll do a little a little bit of that, but I'll do all I also will include my old hits like Band of Gold, Bring the Boys Home. I will be doing some new material and some uh, just songs that I've done down through the years, you know, taken from maybe albums that I had recorded back in the 70s or something. And uh, I'll be, hey, listen, I'll be doing some blues. I'll be doing some Broadway. I'll be doing 
you know, some um, Motown, you know, I'll be covering the gamut. I've got my book, my memoirs. Look, Frida Payne. Beautiful. Yeah, that's my, my new book. It just came out last year. And uh, you can purchase this on Amazon. And the title of your new book, Band it's of Gold, right. is the so, title of one of your early hits. Uh-huh. Well, Band of Gold was my major big hit back in the early 70s. Yeah. And you made a lovely segue when you were talking about the duets that you've done, because Kenny Lattimore is from the Washington, D.C. area. We yeah. know him. We love him. I've heard the song. I played it. I got the video link. It is gorgeous. And you all, the voices blend so beautifully. So thank you for recording that. You're welcome. And also, you know, that song was uh, one of those old Nat King Cole classics, Let There Be Love. Tell us a little bit about what we're going to uh, learn about you from your autobiography, Band of Gold. I talk about my beginnings. I was born and reared in Detroit. Um, I speak of all the people that affected my life, my grandmother, granddad, my mother, my father. My, my mother divorced my my uh, biological father, Frederick Payne, when I was three and a half. And I talk about my some of my affairs, you know, some of the situations I got into and and how fate led me from one thing to another and and uh, how I got with Invictus Records and Holland Dozier and Holland and the whole bit and, and my relationship to Quincy Jones and, uh, you know, different people who came in and out of my life. So they just have to, you know what they have. To, I can't, I can't tell you too much because you have to just read the book. Get okay, the book and folks, and find out. And folks, that's Band of Gold. It should not be difficult for you to remember that title in terms of it being the autobiography of Frida Payne. And you just heard it. She's telling it. She's telling all. She's she's uh, dropping and drinking all the tea. So, uh, <laughs> so you need to really check out that book. Let's talk a little bit more about other things that you do, because it's my understanding you're out doing dates, performance dates, several times a year. You're traveling the country. Well, so yeah. Mm -hmm. well, after you come to D.C., where are you off to after that? Do you have your schedule already planned out? Yes. When I come to D.C., I come. I do the two nights, the 22nd and the 23rd at Blues Alley. And then five, six days later, I do a one night thing here in LA in Malibu at the beach and it's a jazz festival night and Will Downing is the headliner. Najee mm -hmm. is also <clears throat> one of the headliners and I'm on the show as well. And uh, then after that, I fly back to New York and I start, <clears throat> start, <clears throat> sorry, I start rehearsals for Ella Fitzgerald, First Lady of Song. I'm doing that theatrically. Uh, it's the play where I portray Ella, and it's going to oh be at the Madison Theater at Malloy College in Rockville, New York. And, and how long is that? I'm sorry. How long is that engagement going to be? Three, three weeks. Well, you're a class act, and we thank you so much for being with us here on Win TV, produced by the Washington Informer newspaper. We're excited that you're coming into D.C. People will have a chance to see you at Blues Alley in Georgetown, and um, y'all come on out and see yeah. Peter Payne, because yeah, she's going to give you all the stuff you want to <laughs> hear. I intend to do that, and also I just want, hey, listen, I just want to see folks. I just want to see faces and I want to see some of them politicians too. Okay. 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 I want some of those congressmen and some of those senators. I hope they are in town. They come and catch my show. Okay. Y'all heard it. You got the invitation. So come on out and thank you again for being with us today. Everybody. We greatly appreciate Frida Payne being with us today and all of y'all have a good rest of the day and you too, Miss Frida. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic. I don't know. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know how I would know what was going on if not for Brenda Seiler letting me 
be aware of what I need to go see and where I need to go eat. I want barbecue all of a sudden for some reason. I I, I don't know. Um, I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us today for WEN TV. Again, I'm Jamila. Clearly, I'm not our publisher, Denise Rolark Barnes, who will be joining us once more as our fearless leader when she comes back next week on Friday. And uh, we will do this all again. Until then, please make sure to pick up a Washington Informer. You can follow us on Facebook. Uh, we will follow you back on Twitter if you become one of our followers. We love it if you would go to Instagram or TikTok or the, the YouTubes and all of that. We do have the Win TV uh, segments on our YouTube, which you are. Uh, we humbly ask that you go and follow and share. Please let a friend know. Also, if you see something that you think the informer should be writing about, if you want to interview, if you want to read an interview with a particular person that the informer should be doing, news at WashingtonInformer.com. We all read this. We do take into account what our listeners and our viewers are interested in hearing. We are a resource and we are here for you. And uh, when TV is here every Friday, we cannot wait to do it again. Uh, thank you one and all for watching. And until next time, when Denise is back, please do be well. <laughs>